Welcome to the longest military barracks in the world. Intrigued? Let's have a look. I mean, this really is a gorgeous building. I spend most of my time visiting forts, fortifications, and battlefields around the world to show you and tell you their story. But here I face a problem. Fortress Maudlin is simply so big, it took us two days just to see most of it. So how can I possibly do it justice in an episode for an hour or two? I will try. And fortunately, the great people here who are trying to restore the old fortress gave me the key and showed me around until way past midnight. Maudlin Fortress is located 50 kilometers north of Warsaw on the Nara River, and it was constructed mainly by the Russians after Napoleon's defeat here. However, Napoleon in 1806 was the one that picked the location and conceptualized the idea of a huge fort here to protect his supply lines when planning eastwards. The first camp here, however, was established by the Poles in 1655 to defend the site against the Swedish invasion. The Swedes took the position and they built here too. They were in turn defeated in 1660, where after nothing happened for 150 some years. After the partitioning of Poland, the area was incorporated in the Russian Empire, and now a Dutch military engineer planned a bastion fortress here. But this also never came into being. However, when Napoleon took the area and pressed on eastwards, he created the Polish state named the Duchy of Warsaw, including that of the area of Modlin. He ordered a fort to be built here on two islands located on the confluence of the Narev and the Vistula rivers. The fortifications were to be temporary and were then to become primarily the supply depot and huge granary storage. However, he changed his mind in 1810. The very concept of the fort was changed, and Napoleon decided to turn Maudlin into the pivotal fortress for his line of fortifications as he expanded it significantly by adding an outer rim of defenses. At this time, mainly wooden stockades and five bastions had been constructed, along with several walls and casemates. By September 1811, more than 19,000 people were taking part in the works. At the outbreak of the Franco-Russian War in 1812, the number of workers exceeded 20,000. This concept of the fortress, however, was never fully completed, as on February 5, 1813, the Russian army appeared with 36,000 soldiers and besieged it. The Polish forces under Dutch General Hermann Wilhelm Deindels defended the fortress until December 1, 1813. It was the last of the French fortresses along the Vistula to capitulate. And then things began to change. Initially, the fort was manned jointly by Polish and Russian soldiers, as it was now located in the Congress of Poland, a state now within the Russian Empire. Now, in case you don't know, the Poles do not like to be ruled over, and they rose up several times against the Russians. And after the Polish uprising of 1830, the Russians began to expand the fortress inside Warsaw as well during the years of 1832 to 1841. The whole area underwent a huge expansion to host large garrison troops who were tasked with preventing another Polish uprising, as well as to defend Russia's western frontier. It became part of the chain of fortresses surrounding Modlin and Warsaw. The most notable new works built were a fortified barrack building, 2,200 meters in length, which was to serve as the last line of defenses for the fortress. In 1844, a beautiful large granary building was constructed on the estuary of the Narev River. 
Polish architect Jan Jakob Gay designed the granary not only for storing food but also as a defensible position at the bridgehead of the rivers. Other than that, the construction ceased for 40 years and the fort began to deteriorate until a new war loomed. After the Franco-Prussian War ended in 1871, relations with the Germans also deteriorated and new forts were constructed in the years 1883 to 1888. Eight modern forts were added, roughly forming a ring within two to four kilometers distance from the central fortress, and the older parts were modernized as well. But war did not come to Maudlin just yet, and construction slowed until the Russian fleet was mauled exceptionally well by the Japanese in 1905 something which woke up the Russian military leadership, and again things began to change. In 1909, when General Vladimir Sukhumlinov became the war minister for the Russian Empire, he wanted to scrap the bulk of the Russian fortress system, and they were completely obsolete at the time. The outer forts were built at a distance of about 8 kilometers from the citadel, by the year 1900, even field guns could fire past that, and Zhukunlinov was of course overruled by the old system of old boys who do not like to change things. Instead, the fort system was slated for an 800 million ruble upgrade, with a new belt of forts to be added. The fortress was also to receive a large number of heavy artillery pieces. The new construction work continued, until the German army approached the fortress in 1915 during the First World War. The fortress was now designed to serve as a center of resistance deep behind enemy lines. The fortress with its outer 19 forts were one of the strongest fortifications in Europe. The Russian high command expected it to hold out for many months. And when Ludendorff with his army arrived in force, it did not take him much more than barely a week, much to the surprise of everybody. Even the Kaiser came out to the front line to congratulate Ludendorff. After the First World War, Modlin became part of the Second Polish Republic and was modernized with modern bunkers, anti-tank and anti-aircraft equipment. Its main purpose was to provide cover for Warsaw from enemy attacks from the north. The fortress also housed several military barracks including the Engineer Training Center and the Armed Forces Officers Cadet School, something which would return after the Second World War. Maudlin Fortress was also fought for during the German invasion of Poland in 1939. The Maudlin anti-aircraft battery, which was credited with shooting down more Luftwaffe planes than any other in the entire September campaign. Fortress Maudlin capitulated on 29 September as one of the last to lay down its arms in the war and surrendered its 24,000 troops, which General Victor Tomei ensconced the army of Lodz in the fortress after failing to fight his way back to Warsaw and his was one of the last Polish military units to capitulate. But that did not see the end of the fighting life for the Fortress Maudlin. From October 28, 1944, Fortress Maudlin again became a fortress as the German army and several SS regiments, including the Viking, now defended the area against the advancing Russian forces after months of ferocious battles around Warsaw. Maudlin was used at the divisional headquarters and a collection point for the SS. Here also ran the railheads for the supplies for the 4th Panzer Division and other German armies. The old fortress, now the line formed around it, held up impressively against the Russian onslaught, causing enormous casualties amongst the Russian soldiers and armor. However, 2,679 German soldiers who fell in those battles are also buried within the Maudlin walls. On November 9th, the old Maudlin fort was shelled 
and 30-some shells hit the buildings before a Russian raiding party attempted to storm the line. However, they were soon driven back. Thereafter, mortar attacks struck the airfield, but the German forces held their line around Modlin until January. Eventually, the fortress buildings would be repaired and handed back to the Polish army. Also, the airfield was significantly expanded, and it became an important area of operations for the Warsaw Pact countries during the Cold War. There was tank regiments, cadet schools, and Air Force personnel. Each regiment had their own kitchen. There were four large kitchens and eight smaller ones. There were sports clubs, officers clubs, and there was also a darker side of Modlin, as political prisoners were held here in one of the sections which were turned into a political prison. The squadron's pilots and the air crews had their quarters here as well. And here, pilots from the North Vietnamese Air Force were being trained during the Vietnam War. And just then, to take a complete opposite side of a U-turn, after the Cold War ended, American soldiers and pilots also stayed here while training Polish soldiers and personnel. And the first baseball game ever played in Poland was played here between American and Polish soldiers. But when the Polish military moved out, it only took a few decades for the grand old buildings to begin to decay seriously. Until the fort was purchased by a group who now owns it and is restoring the building slowly. They already replaced 800 meters of roof. The beautiful buildings used for the soldiers' laundry have been turned into a really cool hotel where I stayed while I was here and I can only recommend it especially the breakfast buffet. They also opened a museum here while preparing the enormous site for showings. And it is really a tall order given the mere size of this place. And of course, as it is with any fortress, there simply have to be a bridge leading into it. And it leads to one of the most amazing bridge buildings I've ever seen. But the construction of the bridge, or what remains of it, unfortunately, it has of course been destroyed. But this is iconic, and even seen in a few Polish films. These structures are so iconic that they're talking about rebuilding the bridge. I'm not sure this should just remain as it is. Although I would very much like to have the bridge house opened up as a museum on its own. Because it's worth seeing, I can tell you. And you have to remember, when we say Fortress Modlin, and I show you the long-sided buildings, that is not really it. That's the barracks. They were housing cannons, black powder cannons, when it was originally constructed. Eventually, it would turn into soldiers' barracks rooms when black powder cannon were no longer the thing to do. The entire area is covered with parts of this fortress. Here, the amazing officers building that they're currently restoring. But at every step and every walkway in the forests and the nature, not only the 19 fortresses surrounding Fortress Maudlin, but also the powder magazines that are just beyond gorgeous. Powder magazines like this, you do not build them like this anymore, unfortunately. I have to give it to them for these doors are almost works of art. Exploring the inside of the outer walls. And there's just so much to see. The entire Fortress Maudlin complex was an enormous expanse, included by the time of World War II an airport and also the 19 outerlaying forts that were surrounding and protecting the forts were in action both World War I and World War II, but we're going to get back to them soon enough. During the Cold War, there was a huge military airport here, now it's turned into a civilian one, but a lot of the buildings are still occupied by civilians. Here you can see the change in color of the bricks. And that usually denotes bomb damage from the Second World War. And the Germans did drop a few bombs on this. It has since been uh, re 
repaired and rebuilt in original style. But that is definitely an impact that's been repaired. You can see how it radiates from this one point. And the old fortress Maudlin certainly has seen its share of battle, both during the First World War and 1920 thereafter, where the Poles fought the Russians, and of course during the Second World War, both in 1939 and 44, where the Russians shelled the Germans who occupied the fort. There's hardly a more perfect place for restoration than this. Welcome to the longest military barracks in the world. Intrigued? Let's have a look. As you can tell, this is an insanely long building. It has constantly been upgraded, rebuilt, with every evolution of warfare, architecture, and military creature comforts. Like, you know, eventually they would actually install toilets and heating. You know, silly things like that. Now you imagine the windows being gone and there's been open cannon pit here before. Everything that, as it looks now, was built after World War I, after World War II. I don't even know if I can clearly see the far wall down there. And everything changed again. In this end, the Gun crews would sleep and live, and on this side would be the gun. Except, of course, the windows or wrong wouldn't be there. There would be an opening for the gun. It's only in the recent evolutions, the cannons went away and everything turned into barracks and dorms for soldiers and officers. But there was bathrooms, sinks, and water. In the original post-Napoleonic construction by the Russians, there were no such things. That's new. I mean, it's like you have every different type of barrack design in one building, or shall we say barrack layout in one building. With the glass, you have the French fortress designers, the Prussians, here the Russians. I actually like this. And here you have the staircase down. And there's a lot of rooms and a lot of space to renovate. And as you can clearly tell, it just continues. And let's for a minute grab onto, they no longer build them like this. This is the old original water tower here. This structure was simply made to dispense water. It looks like the fanciest caponier in the world, but this was important. I mean, this really is a gorgeous building. And the background there, when the water lines were brought into the building, that's the new water tower. And when I say old water tower, the barracks did not originally have running water. There, in the background, you see the new water tower from when the barracks actually had running plumbing and water throughout. But this amazing old water tower, this was the first. It has a huge water cistern upstairs, and it's made to dispense water to man and horse through the fanciest nozzles you've ever seen. This is how he's supposed to dispense water. And see what happens when the boss shows up with the key. I can finally get into the water tower. And I love the water tower. This is funny, this looks like, this looks like the cannon well yeah. of an old Vapon fortress, doesn't it? <laughs> With the circle of walkway, I could tell people this was a cannon well of an old fort in, in France, and they would believe it. 
I mean, I would imagine the construction is the same. It has to carry a heavy weight. How much water is in here? I don't remember. <laughs> is that a water heater? Uh, this is a um, fireplace, I think. Fireplace. Is that to heat the water or just yeah, to keep yeah, the... Yeah, yeah. So they had hot water coming yeah. out of here. Ooh. Ooh. There's something about round buildings that are just special. And there's something about a hell of a staircase. This is really nice for a water tower that nobody sees. This was built in 1918, 13 yeah. plus. Yeah, plus me. Plus me. And here's the water tank. <laughs> you. Every time I walk up in a circular building, I find something huge made of metal, but usually it flings projectiles. This is just cool. So the water's pumped up from the river in the center, yeah. and then it gets sieved out through that little thing. Yeah. Was this clean? No. <laughs> <laughs> this will probably get better off. A little dysentery never killed anyone, right? That was a joke. Was this for men or for horses? For people and for horses. So the smaller taps were for people water. We still haven't forgotten about the number of bathrooms versus the amount of people. These were actually the bathroom facilities. Inside each one of these, there are 21, well, individual facilities, shall we say. There's eight of these buildings, and there's between 12 to 17,000 soldiers here. You do the math. This was the new water tower. That was built later on, as they started leading water into the actual barracks. And now it's time for the local professionals who's taking care of the fortress, Sebastian and Christoph, to show me around. And we're going to start with one of the dark historic sides of the fortress here. It is incredibly well built. It really is quality, isn't it? it There's a person. So was this a military person? It was for n not only military, civilian, uh, yeah. political. Yeah. And for Polish people. So this is cell? Yeah. Oh. This part, uh, in this part uh, we have windows. And, uh, here so did the prisoners have access to each other? No. Oh. So the doors in between were locked? After 1945, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. We always have to remember there's the rebuilds that happened. So if you were less popular, you got a no window cell without an ocean view. How many people were in these, do we know? Um, 18. 18? 20. Yeah, wow. Giving food, food and take uh, excrements. Yeah, of course there was a bucket inside. Yeah. All of a sudden it takes on a real toll when you start looking at prisoners in, in places. It's funny because when I walk through this place, yeah. my instinct is I want to talk French. <laughs> I look around me and all I think is, this feels French. But this 
building is Russian. Yeah. <laughs> I know, but it it just it just has that feel of it. I mean, it looks very similar to something you would imagine the French would have built. Something about hallways, especially when they turn into staircases down, that are just fascinating and interesting. This was the entry point? Yeah. But for civilians, uh, they, um, they can't go to the inside, to the... Um, Military part? Yeah. Yeah. So would they come from ship? Uh, this is the, the river is right out here, right? Yeah, I think uh, train. Train? Train? Yeah. So there's a train out here? No. Up, no. But... Uh, the train station is uh, about uh, one or two kilometers from this place. So these defensive fire or just communication? This is defensive as well, right? Yeah. It always makes life easier when the right guy shows up with a key. And that's the old granary. Yeah. So the granary had a really bad couple of days in 1939. Uh, not. Uh, hmm. I thought it was bombed by the Germans. Yeah, but only the roof was uh, destroyed. Oh. The Granary was the similar part in right side yeah. of the this Oh, part. so that whole side was yeah. identical. Oh. So prison entrance that's actually protected. Yeah. Or defended, I guess would be the word. Every window on this side building was uh, using to the mm, defense. Yeah. Uh, there was a cannon Was this ever a stairs, or was this always just slope? This stairs, wooden stairs. Wooden stairs, okay, that is... Oh, you mean like here? Yeah, but this is... Uh, in a new... So is this the longest prison block in the world? Would be a whole different question. It is, isn't it? The prison uh, was here uh, to the 90s. Oh, really? that late? Wow. That's... Is... I mean, yeah, you, you've seen prisoners in... Soviet bloc countries in so many places, Baltics uh, as well, in old forts that are just terrible, terrible conditions. But this, it's just, it's a gorgeous place though. I mean, I'm sure the prisoners here wouldn't have thought it was a gorgeous place. But it is. It is a. It's a beautiful space. This is the original floor with the old round stone that I can feel I'm walking on. And yeah, I can see the very traditional pastello colors for this era of the end of the Cold War.
I did not expect to see this here, to be honest. That's where the that's where the bricks went. Yeah. This is uh, These are the beds. Yeah. I mean you have to restore at least one cell so people can yeah, see it. Yeah, yeah. So then people can get married in one room and they can look at <laughs> what they're looking for in the next. <laughs> Well, I'm not going to ask how much fresh air the prisoners got here, but at least they got out. Sometimes, maybe. One more day, one more day, one more day. If, is there anywhere they put their names? But this is new because this is from 1947. Well, new and new, it still counts. <laughs> I kind of like this space. And I like the fact that you're the boss and you get just as lost here as I do. Well, this is, uh, this is not a prison anymore, is it? What was this? Uh, it's uh, part of the barrack, but uh, uh, after 1945. Yeah. This is very nice and open. So they had barracks on top of the prison. Yeah. Well, something else. That'll teach you how to behave, I guess. When did the army stop using this? In 1989. Really? Yeah. The, this, uh, the newest part is uh, near the Red Tower. dying to see what the fortress up here looks like, what this tower is. I will say a beautiful building though. Certainly these are the original bones of this. But can you imagine the mad activity in a base with 17,000 soldiers? And I mean, it's a big area, but it's not that big. Wow. Hmm. What a nice sunlit office. And here we are out on the roof, which is absolutely insanely gorgeous. Nine kilometers of hallways. Yeah. And how long is the roof? If we ran the roof to the other side over there, it's uh, I think it's two and a half kilometers. <laughs> so if we circle the entire roof from where we are to over here, that's a good bit of running. Except that roof over there looks a bit slippery, so maybe we shouldn't. And the observation tower. 
So normally I would think these were made for for defense, but they're really just for decoration, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. But it's a heck of a view. And Warsaw is in there, that way? Way in there? Look there. Look there. Yeah. The higher stairway is too dangerous for them. Well. Yeah. Ooh. Uh, it's yeah, yeah. Almost like climbing a ladder. Wow. So what is the point of the observation tower except watching for the enemy we were talking about? Mm -hmm. So we saw every shipment that came here to go to the free city that died at that time for the shipment. So we could observe the whole river and all the moves there. Okay, so it also had like a harbor control. Yes. First of all, we could use the soldiers to control the Warsaw and to control the river because when you could ship them to blow up the walls uh, to die um, uh, if you needed to. Later on, we had the first military Polish port here at the other side. We'll see it from the tower. Uh, it was constructed in Sebastian Kalp in the year. Yes, 1919. Uh, and it uh, constructed lesser ships that patrolled the Vistula and Nara area. In the pigeon station. There was a pigeon station? Yes. Uh, of course there every was. Every citadel has a pigeon station. Uh, this one was renovated by us. Uh, and you know, they built it, uh, them not in the citadel because of the smell. Just imagine 500 birds inside. Y yes, I know what, what <laughs> pigeons do to statues, monuments, houses, buildings, and cars. <laughs> cars, anything. And this is the granary. It was constructed after one of us, our uprisings um, to take all the wheat and all the food out of the citadel. Because if somebody would have caught it, they didn't have any food to defend. Mm -hmm. uh, it was after the uprising because when we had one of our up uh, uprisings, I'm looking for the month in English. November. September, November. November uprising, right? Uh, well, almost all of the citadel's force was used to Warsaw to accumulate and fight with us. And 4,000 soldiers were stationed here. Our uprisingers came and you know, it was like in those times, even our Polish officers were in the Tsar's army yeah. and they were uh, hold up there. So we just talked to them, they opened us the gates and the Citadel played not a big role because it was mostly a um, granary and ammo station for the Uprisingers mm -hmm. here. So the granary was built at the same time as the fort after? Or after? after. So 1840? Uh, in 1847, it, it was built by what the, the National Bank of Poland, wasn't it? Yeah, the National Bank for a moment. For yeah. a moment. For a moment. It, it was everything. It was even the um, center of our Polish Navy at that time. In 1949, oh. uh, it was uh, just a um, uh, station for ships with everything, but the, uh, the Germans bombed the left. Uh, left side, good. The left side, and it was never rebuilt. Okay, so you're talking about the bricks that were taken to yeah. rebuild Warsaw, and there was a professor called Zapatovich, and oh. he uh, held it back uh, that taking of the bricks, but there were no bricks to reconstruct it then. Yeah. Well, most of the houses from a roll around are from bricks from the citadel as well. You know, that happened all over Poland, it happened after World War One, after World War Two, yeah. yeah. after the Franco Prussian War. I keep looking at damage, I wonder if it's natural or it's battle damage. So we come down to the intersection here. The inner fortress is so big, you can still have a complete ecosystem of wildlife and ruins hiding away on the premises without ever finding them. What we're actually seeing behind us that I was so hoping was, you know, something exotic like shrapnel and bomb damage is really not. No, it was just water damage from the destruction of pipes and uh, from uh, rain, simple rain pouring in um, inside. You must remember that the fort was left for over 20 years with no body, no heat, no anything. So when we bought it in 2012, this was 
in a very more direct da uh, damage state. We fixed uh, a lot of uh, roof uh, right now for the few years. We are uh, constantly fixing places. You were at the Cadets Gates, you were at the Red Tower. It looked a whole lot of worse. Uh, we are trying to raise money as a foundation for uh, renovating all those places, but you must remember that this building has over two kilometers, mostly two, three or four stores high and one store down. Uh, uh, the complex renovation of this building we couldn't stand financially right now, so we need to constantly fix, start with the worst problems and get to the second ones later. And I hope it won't be a lot of time when the Citadel will look a whole lot better than now. So here is a driveway into the fort. That's very cool. And there's another over there. This really truly reminds me of Papaville. I have to say it does. Officially the first word I have understood in this fortress. That says munition storage in German for those of you who do not know. And what I love about this particular part is this is where the biggest tank battalion was, right? Right. And it was equipped with some 200 of the small tankettes, which is why there's one sitting outside the museum entrance. Go inside, you will feel like you're in a church. <laughs> Oh, I love that. What an enormous empty space. So how many tons of bombs did the Germans drop on this place? 100,000 tons of bombs in 29 days. And none of them hit this? Well, none of them hit this because this is a bridge that leads outside. If you would go to the uh, part on the other side, you will be outside of the citadel. In a natural uh, ground level that you could get out. And they could use this window to sweep out of the citadel here. That window? Yeah. Because technically, right now, we are at zero level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The scarp falls very sharply here. So when they were constructing the citadel, they just built more stores. That makes sense. So there was never a, an exit here? Well, the way there, there was a bit, there was. There was an exit uh, earlier, but our soldiers would just form it like this, right? I mean, that, that steel beams usually... And as you can see, that it doesn't look natural here, those bricks. No, and like the, usually when you put a steel beam, it's, it's, a, it's a overhang over a door or something. You can see there are steel metal uh, bottles on that. Oh. That's a hell of a gate. Was that wood with steel? Or was that all steel? We are thinking that mostly it was wood. I must have to have been. Yeah. And this is where the tank battalion was. Yes. I don't know what it's like. So you, the, some of the tankettes were, were, were British and some of them were French, but you yeah. did your own modifications. Yes, yes, it was called TK1, TK2, TK3 and TKS, that's the latest model. Uh, and we have a mix in the Second World War. Sebastian is looking for uh, the tankette lifts. Yeah, here, there is the tankette lift. Oh, this is, this is not very big. Yeah, and the whole engine is up there intact. So, what was this? How, what did the tank head live? Like a, a three, you four? Think like a right. We are on the lift itself right now. So, they would roll the, the tank head in here. Yeah, put it up, put it up. And they could work. Um, oh, so they would work under it? Yes. Okay, so like a car lift? Yeah, like a car lift, but a bigger one, technically. As you can see. Just well, if you have experience, you can just try to climb up. 
Nu știu ce trebuie să zicem, ce trebuie să zicem. Da, da. I, I certainly will try not to. I hate when I do that. So theoretically, you could make it work. Well, I could do, yes. And then you could pull your tankette yeah, in here yeah. and have the tourists run it up and down. Well, we were thinking about getting those tourists up there to see the engine. The original corridors looked like this. Those are not original doors. Yep. They were bigger. And then during World War, before World War One, this. When did they start the modification? The modifications came after the First World War uh, and in the 50s. And the floor was wooden back then. Oh, yeah, like here? Yes, like here. Uh, but that's between the First and Second World War. Yep. Because the original wood was, uh, was oak. Right. And we are at the cinema. At the here cinema? Yes. Oh, you are. You can shoot films from here. Oh, that's awesome. Well, we don't have films right now. Oh, you don't have a projector or anything in there? No. There was one that was here, but as you can see... I work in the film business, I have to see how these things are shown. This even if it wasn't... This are a little bit dangerous. <laughs> uh, what's life without risk? <laughs> a projector room. So, how old was this projector? When it was this? It was constructed between the First and the Second World War. And it worked until the 90s. Awesome. I, I don't go with tourists to this place because I'm very scared that they might misstep. Well, when it comes to, um, to people getting hurt from obvious things that they can avoid, yeah, I know. I'm very much a fan of natural selection. Well, we have 60,000 people, so we have seven buildings that were used as toilets. In every building there were 24 toilets. That makes 168 so, uh, eight toilets for 6,000 people. Yeah. One battalion, 30 minutes, one time a day. What? Yes. Yes, technically, uh, when they use the numbers, that it will work. Well, it didn't. The soldiers just go to bushes and hide it uh, for all. Yeah, of course it didn't work. Go to pee. <laughs> I mean... But yeah. when they've constructed the second tower, they used the hydraulics to, uh, to use toilets everywhere, it was fine. For 24 years, we had 168 toilets. Oh, so this is a 1950s upgrade. Yeah, this is the 1950s upgrade. Uh, but there are some very fine monuments of history as well. Hmm. This is what stays here. It's a place to hold the TV set. That thing? Yes. Uh, the I'm just looking big, at right? <laughs> looking at this thing is... This, uh, uh, this is uh, the tank division, uh, the drivers, mm, the uh, sappers, I mean uh, anti-bomb yeah. uh, division, uh, anti-air division. Here we have uh, communication division and train division. That is absolutely awesome. So, and that is just interesting art. Yes, that's uh, art that somebody constructed. As you can see, well, we don't know if it's a god or an azam azam god. Well, this wasn't used to help artillery. It was used to take the beds up. The beds up? Yes, they used a chain, a bed, and they just pulled it up here. When the soldiers got depressed and something, so well, uh, sometimes that happened that the soldiers tried to just jump off the stairs here. Now. Really? Without this protection, well, it would be fatal. This was a Cold War issue then? Yes. This wasn't a pre-World War One issue? Yes. Well, 1,980 soldiers fell here in the, Citadel, in the Second World War. 1,900 here? So, oh, this one's good. 50s. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's not World War One. No, rather the 50s to 60s. What was this? Uh, it was probably a bar, because the restaurant is right before the cinema. You hey, the rest. Leave your coats. The, really? Yeah. They actually did a whole coat check before the restaurant? Yeah. That is so cool. Well, it was pink earlier. <laughs> Well, you said there were no women, so that troubles me. Well, later there were civic, civic, civilian civilian workers that were women. Uh, my friend found it five years ago and uh, was looking for it for five years, and now we found it. 
the inscription. Tak, this is General Jaruzelski, the last general that was uh, before uh, breaking the communism down. Mm -hmm. And those are his words. The only one is safe who cares about peace when there is uh, when there is time left. General V. Jaruzelski. This is features we've seen from other forts, although they're not quite laid out this way. It's not as elaborate on this side, but the sheer size makes up for that. It's almost as if they're built in different structures or designs. It almost gets you the feel that there were 10 different uh, architects tasked with building and designing each section. That is sort of what it, what it gives the impression of. Because everything is just a little different than everything else. But I have never been in a place where I felt I should be speaking French as here. However, as I later found out, I was not wrong in my guess that there was more than one architect or building designer. There were actually two separate architects. One that designed and constructed each long, and then they met on the two sides. It's very interesting to see how quite a few different building designs and construction designs of various fortresses from around the world are all encompassed in this one enormous building structure. You see a little bit of everything, as if both architects had taken some inspiration from forts around the world, from the Russians, from the French, the Swedes, and so on. Yet here we are, and this is an amazing structure to behold for that reason. Behind one of the other gate buildings, you'll find the defended wall full of firing ports. And further on from that is a more recent power building still containing the most amazing old power plants. What's the other one, a gasoline? No, the other one is on steam. A steam-powered engine. Steam powered engine. Yeah, from Sweden. It came here in parts from um, by the river. Wow. This is the big wheel. Well, they held a fire pit here. Thank you. Right. It took the water. It turned to steam and the steam pushed the wheel to go around. There was... Um, so, you had the fire in here and you had the water running through the pipes? Yeah and the pipes would then expand into the steam engine. Yes. That is absolutely amazing. Powered up our cereal. What, what year is this? Are we talking 1800 or, or before pre-World War I? Or? Well, that says that it's probably from between the both wars, the first and the second one. But, but everybody says like that. Some people say it was earlier. Started in 1924, technically. And here you have the coils too. So this is the pipes again. Yeah, this is the generator yeah. powered up. Uh, this is a uh, uh, diesel one. Mm. So you're gonna make it run, right? <laughs> it's possible. It's possible. Oh, 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 yeah. <laughs> but oh, and this is the machine room. Well, there's a few of the dials missing. So this came from somewhere else to be installed here in the fort? Yeah, because it uh, produced a lot of more energy than the steam one. So not only did this power the fort, but also yes. the industry? Yes, the local industry as well. That's actually quite amazing. There was um, a power station somewhere, but you know how it's hard to get plans about the citadel from the Russians? We know that in 1919, at the Cadiz gates, uh, there was a power plant right uh, before the, the Russian church. It will be easier to say, mm -hmm. so, excuse me. And there was a power station back then, and we found about it uh, three weeks ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah really? Because, yeah, somebody posted a plan that had the Cadet school and the power station. As well, he didn't. We didn't. He didn't know what he's posting about the fortress, and oh. I thought, we were, "Wow!" So that's where the power station was there. Oh, that's awesome. 
this all over. So the, the surrounding forts here, did they have little generators? The one that was upgraded before World War I, did they have generators? They had little, small little power plants. Because I was in a few of them and that's kind of what it looked like. What smoke? I smoke cigars. Well, not right now. Oh, look at this amazing building. So this is behind, behind the panel. It's behind the technical panel. Oh, and here we have some of the electrical. We'll sneak through here. These old panels are gorgeous. Look at this. All right, here we're cooking. What a shame all the dials are gone. These are metal where they would, in Mutsik, and they would use marble. Around the water. Yep. There's lamps here just to save the light, right? little lamps here. There were little lamps, not electrical yet. Or were they? Nope, they were not electrical. And this guy would go all the way down. Yes. So how long is this gallery? Well, this has almost 300 meters. So is there an entrance into the fort from the other side? Yes, there is. And you had the lights. And you had the firing. And you had the ventilation. There would be no way to roll a hand grenade out of here at an enemy. Yeah, What's that doing here? We don't know really. Uh, but, uh, yeah, there were no hand grenade stations and this gallery was destroyed to half earlier and was reconstructed. That oh, really? Thing. Oh. And the second thing, our military left just trash here. Every uh, place that we are passing right now was filled with trash. Unfortunately, I believe you. We are thinking that uh, um, not a half of the sum of the uh, gallery is from the French time, even. Mm -hmm. And it was just a gun station earlier, a yeah. uh, station, excuse me. And then when the Russians came in, they just uh, built on top of it. Built more, longer. Yeah. And when you walk, you think there's no end to it. I know, I so love that part. 
There's nothing I found more interesting than going through underground tunnels in old forts or castles or fighting positions. You find a tunnel, you never know what you find at the other end. Yes, you're right. And sometimes you... Well, a few years ago, we, at the level, not personally, but we were digging uh, under an uh, anti, mm, anti mine, anti digging place, a mm -hmm. Russian uh, countermine uh, uh, passage. Yeah. And we found a guy from 1939 lying there. Really? Yeah. German or Polish? Polish. He never left home. What is it doing here? I mean, in the middle of the gallery, what is the boiler doing here? When it was destroyed in the First World War, um, they used uh, the, uh, the place from the gallery to construct water passage for the whole fort. We have filters at the other side here, uh -huh. just like the filters in Warsaw. So this is a water pump? Yeah. That would pump so with part of the ones that... was a water boiler, uh, water, to heat the water. To heat the, the heat, okay. So that's why we're standing on something way deeper. That yes. was the... Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's made in Poland? Yeah. It's you can see the construction date. It's 1938, <coughs> just a year before the, the Second World War, from a place called Biosko. And here you see the military did what they did, so we construct something that they needed. Yeah. <coughs> Cement stuff here. This is... During the Second World War? Uh, during the First. The First World War? Yes, you can see everything was just leveled like this, not true like an original one. So what, what, what was it leveled in battle or...? Mm, we don't know. There are no pictures and everything that could tell us why it was leveled We have just one picture that we can see that it was destroyed here. Maybe I mean, there was quite, there's quite a bit of fighting in World War One in the beginning, out of 15 and then in 18. Yeah, but we don't have any pictures or information about mm. the destruction of the gallery. I certainly imagine this has something to do with my favorite thing in the world, food. And I know this because here was a kitchen. And that's why there was ventilation outside that I noted. So, of course, modernized a number of times. But the walls show these were original, given this thickness. That is not something you build to decide, redesign the layout. You're not going to build massive walls like that. So these are the original bones. fence that would guide the soldiers in front of the kitchen and then with their plates and out. Now, I would say that in my time in the military, I don't remember anybody ever skipping line. And I would imagine the discipline was harsher back then. I'm just saying. I do wonder if the kitchen area was the same as a hundred and some fifty years ago. This we recognize. Same machinery used for the ventilation of nuclear bunkers. That's fascinating. But of course, technology is technology. We have all seen Mutzig and Wagner and the huge Prussian forts. This is not that long ago since these were in use, and they really don't look that different, do they? The technology from the late 1800s of fortresses hasn't changed. It is exactly the same. The cookers are exactly the same, with the bricks inside lining the walls for heat, with a huge basin sitting inside, heated from below. 
Yeah. Basin coming down on here. There's this huge metal basin. <laughs> it's funny how these things just don't change. This could be used today. I could clean this up and I could heat or cook food in here. One of the original buildings dating back to the time of Napoleon is the Square Redoubt, which was once one story taller and had been surrounded by a high mound. Making the Redoubt situation a little questionable, not a lot of information exists about the thoughts which lay behind this construction, however. And there's a bit of a mystery to this building because of its shape and because of the ditch that used to surround it, which was actually higher than the building itself. So you have a square redoubt to begin yes. with, yes. okay? That's the first thing. That's an interesting start. Okay, <laughs> Napoleon planned it, that's the second thing. <laughs> or was he a big drinker? <laughs> we don't know, but uh, the general idea was to have a square redoubt out of it. A yeah, square redoubt, okay, I mean, it's, it's, um, okay. And as you can see, the bricks are not the same as in the citadel because in, uh, when uh, the French and Polish soldiers came here, we didn't have lots of money, so uh, the materials were worse and the bricks are worse as well. That's why it's... Uh, and it's crooked and the lines are not straight. Yes. And, and was there an upper part? That's yes, there was uh, another an floor here. Uh, it was destroyed as well. Well. The second thing you need to know is we have an uh, outer wall here that when the Russians started building it and uh -huh. uh, uh, Redoubt was supposed to defend it, when they finished it was higher than the Redoubt itself. So the Redoubt started to be useless as a defensive place. Yeah, yeah. So they switched <laughs> it to a place that they stored medicine. I mean it was fenced in and why is there yes. polar bear in the window? Oh, where's the polar bear? Well, we had two polar bears in our army. No polar bears, two bears. Two excuse bears. Me. One was polar and one was a brown bear. The most known in Poland uh, bear, it was called Wojtek, and it was a brown bear. This brown bear was uh, going with the General Anders uh, army through the whole Europe. And he ended up in Edinburgh, and, yeah. uh, in Edinburgh, in a zoo. An actual bear was traveling? Yes, he was fighting in Monte Cassino. He was uh, having ammunition at his back and he carried it with the soldiers. Of course he did. And we had an earlier bear that we didn't know about and it was a polar bear. She was called Barbara in Polish, Baszka. And Murmańska because she was uh, taken by a battalion, Polish battalion, the station on the north of Russia. They were fighting with an international co coalition with the Bolsheviks. They've uh, had a rest in the north of the Russia for two, two weeks. And it was a story about a woman. A local woman uh, was very beautiful and a Polish soldier wanted to be with her and he concurred with an Italian soldier. Uh, the woman uh, liked uh, animals, so uh, the Italian officer bought an Arctic uh, fox to impress her and our Polish soldier went to the market and find a little polar bear. So he took him in and wanted to show off, but then uh, a dog came to that bear and starting uh, to want something from him. The bear got scared and uh, almost killed the dog. And it was not a simple dog, it was uh, the dog of a British general that led the coalition. So the soldiers were very scared that something would happen to that bear. So they made her a soldier and she traveled with them through the Great Britain because BBC contacted us a few years ago and they made a report about it because that bear was seen in Leeds, we have pictures, so they asking where is this bear now, well this bear came to Poland and to the fortress and she lived here for four years uh, in 1918 there was a big parade held, held by our national hero uh, General Piłsudski in Warsaw, in the uh, Saskis uh, Park, 
and Bashka was there. Bashka learned to walk on two feet, learned to salute, and we have a picture of that bear that shakes the hand of General Piłsudski. Well, the story ends a little bit tragically, because in uh, summer, Bashka was very overheated, so the soldiers took her to the river Vistula to get herself a little bit cooler. Uh, they used a big chain to hold her up when she was swimming, but she uh, loosened the chain and swam at the other part of the river, at the other river bank. And there were, uh, mm, I'm looking, farmers there. Mm, and they were using equipment to use on the fields and you can imagine what a farmer from the uh, 1920 uh, sees a white bear running at them well because she loved people she didn't uh, she was never endangered by them so she wanted to greet them and uh, they've just killed her when the soldiers found out that the farmers killed Bashka they've almost uh, not blew up but sent fire to the whole uh, place that was over there and from that story that's just cutting it short we made a place uh, a game for children and families there are figures of Bashka everywhere around the fortress uh, the uh, kids have a quest that they look at and they need to find all the polar bears hidden in the fortress okay I mean, I mean at least you have firing positions in all directions yes. There are fire positions and they are countermine tunnels as well. <laughs> I know. We haven't digged up to the full yet, but we started digging and we are finding uh, places. You know what's a chaco? The hat of the French soldier? Yeah. Well, we found a chaco like this inside. Wow. It's a tunnel that lead uh, to an artillery stance uh, that was in the scarp of the outer wall. Oh, okay. So it's it's a, it, uh, under it's a tunnel under the uh, under the ditch here. Yes. Oh. Why is it collapsed? Do we know why it's collapsed? Okay. So we started making archaeological digs here, just looking that if they constructed these dishes, yeah. they didn't construct them. So they started making the tunnel and they didn't finish it. Okay, that also. But makes. we found some things inside those tunnels. And they are at our museum. Why is here a uh, lion over to the center? I think that this is something that was reconstructed later. I mean, it almost looked like a small technical tunnel for some reason. Well, I see the I see those narrow grooves a lot in places. I just never figured out why. So, what weaponry would they have here? They'd have you have the. But what what what's the center gun? What's the was a not a mitrailleuse? What would the, what would you guys have had? Maxim, or well, something heavier? Well, they had Maxims back then because we even took out some, yeah. some of them. But I mean, this looks like since you had this heavy uh, ventilation. It might be something bigger, like a little 5.5 or something. Well, I don't know the caliber technically, really. I'm not an expert in that. Uh, because the only thing we have, we have pictures. So these two are not con Well, they are connected. I, yeah, they were connected. But not oh. historically, because here is an enemy place. Yeah. So you have a redoubt that's not round and not uh, fully connected? Yes. Okay. No, I mean... And... With some trash. Well, you know... Like you said, there's a lot to clean up. And Rome wasn't built in a day. Yes, but I think we won't be able to go to that upper level because there is no ladder. There's the second channel. Dug up a little as well, uh -huh. you can see. Well, staircase too. I mean, at least they planned for it. There must have been a, a piece of board over or something. Yeah. Otherwise, I also noticed there's no bathroom here. Well, there was a place for the set to go up here, but 
Let me do it to climb. We are not sure about this that was used for climbing, but... It's pretty big for a munition lift, but uh, then again... You, know, you never own a... We don't have pictures from the inside here, yeah. just from the outside, the historical ones, right? So there was a third floor? Yes. And we have no idea when it decided to no longer exist? Mm, we know the date, we don't know the date. Kiedy istniało? No. Dach y, apteki jest jeszcze na zdjęciach chyba z między wojny. Oh, so it must have fall between the first and second world war because Sebastian said we have pictures of the roof from that oh. time. So it could have been shelled during World War One and then eventually just come down. Yeah, and they didn't reconstruct it after, right? Yeah. Well, I mean, considering this looks like a firing position, there would have been a floor over here. It's hard to believe that there would have been a staircase here since people will be standing out there shooting. I think there was a... There was a and I mean, the, 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 stone, the stone works all look like that's been cracked. Okay, so it must have been destroyed. Yeah, because... Oh, we don't know where that second... So there would be the little walkway behind it that we can't crawl through this little firing point. I've never seen a powder magazine on a sloping floor. So here you see how you could reinforce the entrances to the fighting positions, steel doors, and you could put in extra plates here to close it. And here you have the memorial. Here is a monument about our Polish uprising in 1846. Uh, some um, of our uprisers were killed at that place here. Hey, which which uprising? You had a few. November or Warsaw Ghetto or which one are we talking about here? Because you had a few. Uh, 1863. Okay. Those you had the November uprising. I mean, you you rise up a lot. These are the names of the guys. The prizes here. They were present in the prison that you were mm -hmm. earlier there. Yeah. And you still had the artillery hook. Yep. Well, everywhere inside the fortress. There were no trees here. Yeah, of course. So there's the river at the other side. There's a big scarp right here. You can go through this hole, you will see it. You can see here were all the defenses from the river. Now we are at Vistula, not Nara, the bigger river. So... Everywhere here, there was stances for defenses. So, what, what, you had cannons on the on the roof? Because no, I don't see any... No, there were cannons on the roof. Here this. is just a place to hold up for the defenses. The stances are at the right side here. Okay. If yeah, we could just go a little bit further. This is all from the Russians' time. Well, early black powder to begin with. Well, yes. I guess early... As well. looking at the front of the building. This was shrapnel damage from the time of the war. Some of these sections have been completely rebuilt because they're destroyed by German bombing, 1939. 
And again, you see just damage to the building. And this is one of the two gates leading out of the fortress from the other side. On the other side here was a wooden uh, bridge that led over the moat that was destroyed in, during the war. The little guardhouse is sitting on each side of the actual uh, gate, but with Tuscan pillars, come on, that's just overkill. Built in 1836, and way down there is a powder magazine that was destroyed during the war, 1939. That served as the headquarters for the command general for the fortress here. A lot of this was destroyed, shot up, and had been rebuilt since. You can still see the impact scars. And here with the change of bricks, you can see this entire section was rebuilt. Slightly lighter brick, it was completely destroyed, 1939. And also, of course, the windows had been remodeled from being firing ports. And my particular little love for the little tankettes. I always did love these, but what I really do have is a special respect for the people who went to war in them. It's a little two-man tankette, and they were going up against the German army and what they had. This was not a fair fight, and they, yet they went anyway. So respect for the crews, and they are kinda cool. I actually would like to have one. I could tow my motorcycle. Our general gave up because he thought he was last. He wasn't last technically, yes, right? Uh, but there was no communication back then. Well, there were situations like the Germans uh, just uh, using planes to throw uh, flyers uh, that uh, were called to the defenders of the city. The city will give up. You have nothing else around. Uh, well, it was an honorable capitulation. It was signed not at the citadel, but a little bit, bit in an earlier place, a halfway to Warsaw. Uh, and the soldiers, the officers, could have their uh, parade swords with them. But it was like this the uh, uh, attacking German uh, general said, I can let you out, but at the other side of the gate there is Gestapo, and I, it cannot be helped. So many of the soldiers. Uh, when they were leaving the citadel, was caught um, by uh, uh, those troops and held in prison camps back then. Uh, the second thing about uh, this war and uh, something that we found a little bit earlier, I mean a half an year ago, uh, a great granddaughter of one of the defenders in '39 came to us uh, with a um, with his diary and he was one of the soldiers that stationed on an assault ship called Kuterka U30 in Polish. It was made from Alpol and it was very light so it could be very fast. There were two Hodgkins attached to it and they destroyed three airships before they needed to sink it because the Germans really wanted badly. So, uh, near the Red Tower, and they've took out those both Hodgkins, they've uh, used grenades to uh, sink the ship, and they mounted them at the top of the White Tower. And those naval soldiers shot five more planes before the Citadel got up, and when the Germans came, they said, we want those people who were at the White Tower. I don't care if they were the defenders, we want them. What did the Poles do? The Poles changed their uniforms from naval to normal soldiers, uh, had new documents quickly printed, and left the citadel with everybody. The damage to these walls really are very telling. Well, the S1, hell of a water tower. Right opposite one of the other powder magazines. Or this is. That is an enormous defensive square. You actually see the ramps where you would roll up the artillery cannons. It looks like signs of shrapnel damage, but... And there could have been these... Could have held containers easily.
This one's breaked over in some way at some point. So the staircase. This was a defensive position. Providing that is for ventilation. This is the kind of hook you would need to move a cannon barrel. With the ventilation and the ceiling there. And if it was a cannon barrel, it was it must have been on a platform. Somebody did something heinous to the staircase. These are the steps. They're almost a meter deep. I don't know if this was deliberate design just to make it really hard or cumbersome for somebody to come up through these. That's possible, I suppose. Here was a steel door. And here we go on the plateau. Wow. The battered profile of this. This have sustained some, well, it's interesting, some serious damage, yet it's all still there. All the rooms are intact. So this should be the remnants of the old bridge yonder hill. There's a lot of open space. This is, everything here is large. Really significantly. Well, these have been destroyed. I caved in. And down to the bridge. And yeah, the bridge house, which is Gorgeous from what I can see from here. But the interesting thing is if this is a bridge, I'm standing in a ditch that's some 250, 300 meters wide. What a gorgeous bridge house that is. That is absolutely stunning. Fire positions below the bridge, cannon positions, firing positions, guarding the bridge itself, the bridge house. What a gorgeous building. And look at all the damage it's taken. Lots of gunfire damage to this. That's the lead into another staircase up into the bridge house. Imagine pulling your cannons up these, up to into their fighting positions. Definitely correct period stoneworks. But when Napoleon left, or was kicked out, there was practically only wooden buildings and barracks here. He had not built most, or started building most of the solid fortress here at all. And this really is ditches within ditches, within huge, walls. Hell of an obstacle to have to traverse. And the fort is some way in there. The other entrance exit that had a little wooden bridge that burned. Still there with its firing positions. Not as elaborate as the bridge house, I will say. Before World War I, all the forts around, and I've seen a few, yeah. and I am really impressed with the steel rebar cement upgrades. Every fort was constructed uh, by somebody else, and the technology was uh, different. And as you can see, if you go around those forts, some are still from bricks, right, like in Yanuvek, and some are from concrete and steel, like Pomihuvek and the later forts on that were constructed, because we constructed them for a whole lot of time and the technology changed. But we still 
found time to construct the, so those forts and construct those defenses because here we lie at the center. Uh, we have Warsaw to protect uh, from the north side. That's why the citadel was essential back then. There was another fort in um, a place called Zegrze and the citadel in Warsaw. Those three forts was a triangle that defended the whole Mazovia region. Maudlin is still surrounded by the forts constructed up till 1915 by the Russian Tsarist army. These are amazing to explore, as they are all constructed by individual military builders. Thus, they are all quite different, making exploring them really an interesting experience. They were all involved in the fighting for Maudlin in 1915, and many of them saw service in 1939 and 44 but have long since remained abandoned. I'm hoping to visit them all and intending to ask the Polish military department to allow me take over one or two to restore myself. Behind me is Vanna von Braun's first test stand. Down the road is Diebna's nuclear reactor. Over there is the Maginot Line and all its amazing forts. I'm visiting them all and I'm bringing them to you. So I really appreciate you like, follow and share what I'm doing, trying to document all these important historical locations. And if you feel like you want to watch more pictures or documents that are used for these, go to lostbattlefields.com. And if you feel like helping me out with my travels, because gasoline and travel and air for you is expensive, my PayPal is there, protectionservicein.com. You are more than welcome, but you don't have to. I appreciate all your support and all your help, and I love seeing these locations, and I love bringing them to you.